Lunch with Docs HD. We have a very special guest today, Dr. Srividi or Vivitanical. She yeah, is with, <laughs> how do I do with that? <laughs> exactly. We lovingly call you Dr. O. <laughs> uh, Dr. O is a neurologist and movement disorder specialist in Phoenix, Arizona. She reached her, received her medical degree from Ch Chilongkong uh, University in Bangkok, Thailand, and she completed her neurology training at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland and her Movement Disorders Fellowship at Cleveland Clinic. She is a faculty physician at the Muhammad Ali Parkinson Center at Barrow Neurological Institute at Dignity Health St. Joseph's Hospital and Medical Center in Phoenix. And she treats patients with various movement disorders, including those with uh, DBS, which is deep brain stimulation, and also specializes in treatment of patients with Huntington's disease. So we're so happy to have you here with us today. We are going to be talking about cognitive symptoms in HD. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you uh, all for joining us. Thank you, Dr. O, for coming on and spending this time, this precious time with us. And thank you to PMD Alliance for hosting and sponsoring this and Teva Pharmaceuticals for funding this wonderful program that we have once a month. Every third Tuesday of the month, we have H, uh, lunch with Docs HD. And so, Dr. O, thank you again. Take it away. We have a great presentation today. Okay, well, great. Thank you so much, Melissa, for the introduction and also uh, Margie also for um, inviting me to this great opportunities. I'm very excited um, to discuss with you all about um, cognitive symptoms that can happen in Huntington disease. Um, you know, I think you are pretty much familiar with um, uh, symptoms that can occur in, in Huntington um, disease, such as the involuntary movement, the career form movement, or the uh, mood change can happen um, uh, due to Huntington disease. We're going to focus mainly on the cognitive change today. And um, I guess, um, you know, some of you probably um, kind of experience this um, change yourself or have witnessed that um, in your family, your loved one. You know, it's very common for me to hear the patient um, complain that, oh, I have harder time talking. I have um, difficulty um, finding words. You know, it's harder for me to understand complicated things. Um, you know, and difficulty thinking. So, you know, um, and, and many of you may probably familiar that, you know, as the disease advances, you know, you see more and more of this change. But, you know, scientists actually found that, you know, the cognitive change, my cognitive change actually can happen um, years before the onset of the career movement or the mother or the physical symptoms, you know. You know, they found at least 10, 15 years, a subtle change that they can detect. And um, as the disease progressed, this continued to um, to change over time. You know, um, you know the reason that you know this cognitive change happened in Huntington disease is because you know, the disease affected the brain in multiple area, and one of the area that um, is you know um, pretty much uh, affected the most is actually an area called caudate nucleus. It is an area that acts as a uh, transit center. If you imagine, um, you know, FedEx or UPS, they has all these FedEx hub or um, transit ten center that acts as a um, area that kind of filter all the package, all the information and decide like where or which one um, they should send it to. So, you know, this area of the brain is affected. So it cause multiple symptoms in, in, in your cognitive function. We're going to talk about communication, about um, memory, learning, about perception, and also executive function. So, you know, first one, very common problem is communication. You know, this is something that is very important for us in order to express what we need, you know, or how we feel, you know, our thinking, you know, and this part is affected um, by Huntington disease. You know, in order to communicate, that's to uh, process, you know, you, the input has to come in and then the output, you know, where you express yourself, you know, and both input and output process, you know, of communication can be affected by the disease, you know, it is harder for Huntington person to process and understand the information that coming in, it is harder for them to decide, you know, 
you know which response they they would like to to uh, to provide back and also the process of um, forming um, sentence finding word and saying it out is also affected also so again it's, you know you know, you may have you know experience this yourself or may see your family member have harder time understanding especially when you um you know uh talk in long sentence or use like a little bit complicated words or sentence you know it can be harder for a person to to understand you know and also you may notice that it take longer time for you to form sentence to find words or for your loved one to to respond to to your question and and not just just that you know the speech the slur speech is another uh, common um uh problem also be part of our aging also if you talk to let's say a 70 year old person they may actually complain of difficulty finding words kind of same thing you know or even um, parkinson patient which is a patient population that we see a lot they also have some of these problems too you know so how can we cope or you know work with this issue there's a few things that you can do to help you know when you talk or uh, communicate to huntington person so firstly, you know, try your best to, to be patient and allow them some extra time to respond, you know. You know, normally you can, like when we talk, we just expect a person to respond right away. But with Huntington um, disease, you know, it can take them, let's say, three, four minutes before they, you know, learning, figure out, you know, all the information that is, you know, um, putting in and, you know, process, you know, forming a sentence to respond to you. So try to be patient and give them extra time to respond, usually helpful another thing you can do also is try to keep the sentence very short and simple like instead of you know saying these long sentences kind of break them and just say one simple sentence at a time um, you know another thing that may be helpful is also um, you know uh, instead of ask them open-end question you know like simple question like Oh, you know, honey, what would you like to have for dinner today? You know, this is actually a very simple question, but for, you know, more advanced parking, uh, Huntington person, this could be actually a difficult question for them. You know, I mean, thinking about it, you know, they have to figure out, you know, what is dinner, you know, what meal it is. They have to decide what options they have and they have to, you know, find the right word for that kind of food and form a sentence and say it out. So these, you know, simple process that we do without thinking every day can be harder for them. So, you know, asking yes or no question, like, would you like pizza or sandwich may be easier for them to actually respond to you, for, you, uh, for them to, uh, to respond as the disease progress. You know, and if you have difficulty um, understanding what they say, you know, you can try to encourage them to repeat or have them spell the word out if it is really hard to understand or have them, let's say, say the first initial letter of that word, you know, or just kind of say the keywords that they want to, to relay information to you. Um, that can be helpful. Um, and then as the disease progress, you know, it's going to be even harder for a person to respond, you know, it's very common for the patient to getting quieter, quieter, and you wonder like, you know, why I ask you a question and you never answer to me. You know, so it, it is harder. So sometimes as the disease become more advanced, you can try using like word. Uh, cards or boards you know that you can point it to the picture okay I want this I feel this so it could be another way to uh, to help with communication problems okay question on that because <laughs> um, <laughs> I am experiencing that actually um, and I don't know if this is a good idea but you can tell me whether this is a good idea if if I'm asking a question and I'm not getting a response what I will do is try to get in front of the person and try to get eye to eye with them and make eye contact. And sometimes that will then bring their attention toward me where I can ask the question or offer the food or whatever and they can say yes or no. But sometimes I've had to do that where I just have to like get right in front of their, their face. Is that... I think that's actually a um, very good suggestion because, you know, try to get the attention is, is one important thing because as a disease progress, it does, does affect your attention um, also. So you may, you know, Huntington person may not 
aware that you are talking to them or um, unable to pay attention to, you know, the things that you are saying to them. So try to um, kind of have them focus to you, I think um, can be very helpful. Mm -hmm. And also um, consider things like speech therapy can be helpful, you know, practicing, you know, saying the word out clearly and also, um, you know, help practicing, you know, finding words, you know, saying things out um, can be helpful. So speech therapy for um, a slow response? Yeah, so, you know, really? speech speech therapists actually can do more than just, you know, you know, help you speak clearly. Uh, a lot of time, the speech therapists are actually uh, trained to do what we call cognitive therapy also. So they can actually, um, you know, find strategy or compensation um, technique for you to help cope with, you know, all these change with your cognition, including the communication problem. You know, they can have you practice, you know, um, you look at the picture, you know, there's actually a lot of apps these days that have these kind of games where you can look at a picture and you can guess what it is, or, you know, you can, um, you know, try to, you know, um, practice different way to, to compensate for this um, change. You know, they, they will help um, find different, um, kind of, you know, coping um, technique for this problem. Does that seem to be uh, frustrating for the patient? Um, I would say it can be difficult for a patient who has more, um, some patient who has advanced symptoms because some other change that happened in the brain also that I will um, probably talk, uh, uh, maybe we can actually discuss about that now. So, you know, besides the communication that can be affected, right, other things that can happen um, in Huntington um, person is, you know, lack of awareness, you know. So this is very common um, change that we've seen, you know. Um, you know, I have patients sitting in the office have a lot of career involuntary movement and I asked them like how bothersome are these involuntary movement the career movement to you and they say no I don't have any career so lack of awareness actually um, is part of the disease, you know, or the patient are falling, the family say the patient fall every day, you know, and I ask them, you know, um, you know, how do you feel about your balance and ask them to use walker and, and they can tell me like, I am fine. I have no problem with balance. So, I mean, unawareness is a problem, you know, a lot more in some than the other. So this could be a challenge, you know, when you try to get the therapy for Huntington person. So, um, you know, and a lot of time it is actually not, not worth fighting with them also, like try to see like who is right or wrong, because it can easily lead to um, argument, you know, and person become upset, you know. I usually have the, pa the patient and family like focus on the action that they, I want them to do instead of, oh no, you do have career, you do have balance problem. You know, I typically just, um, you know, have them focus on like, okay, you need to take pill because you have Huntington disease and the doctor say you should take it or you know the doctor want you to to use the walker and not like try to say oh you have gait and balance you know and or you have to try like a creative different way to you know have a person you know do all these things because sometimes they do not aware about all these change that have happened to the body the yeah, problem with memory and um and learning and also the thinking that is um, getting harder and slower, you know, so with Huntington disease, you know, all these change in the brain, you know, affect all these skills that we have, you know, to remember things, to recall things. So, I mean, if you imagine your brain is like a big library and you have your librarian who, you know, for some reason is very slow and disorganized, you know, it um, takes so long time for them to do things, you know, they don't keep the books in the, the right shelf they don't um, categorize them and when they you know you ask them to look for a book you know certain books they don't have an organized way to search for that book you know they may just randomly look at one shelf and then another shelf and not like go through you know each of them you know in um, you know certain um, a pattern you know and this can lead to a, a problem with Huntington person uh, have difficulty learning new um, skill new information or or recall things, you know, so, you know, it make it harder for them to remember to learn new things. So it makes the thinking process kind of slower. So, um, so when, when you have, you know, a patient with this problem, things that typically help them are, you know, 
you know, uh, try to break tasks for them into small, simple steps, you know, try to break things down, make it simple for them. One at a time, you may have to remind them, like taking medication is very easy for them to forget because they don't remember, you know, to look for like all those, you know, cabinet in our brain, like, you know, what time I should take this certain pill, like it's just so hard for them. So you have to, um, you know, send in a, a reminder to them. You may have to call them to remind them it's time for you to take pill, you know, write down a list of things that you, you want them to do. You know, although even though you, you do have this problem, we still encourage the patient to try to practice doing things and try to learn new things and try to recall things though. Because even though you have problem, but if you don't use it, it's going to get worse. So even though it's harder, we still encourage you to do them. And all those things that is stored in the brain is there, but it just take longer time for them. And the brain doesn't work in an organized way. So it's going to take longer time for them to, to learn things, to remember things, you know, to, you know, for you. <laughs> So I have a question. Why, and I'm not getting any questions in the chat, probably because I'm talking too much, but um, why is it that sometimes they will remember certain things and then other times they're just, it's not there? Yeah, I think it depends on um, multiple reasons. So you know, first thing is usually things that happened long time ago in the past that has been there, it's stored in a very uh, deep part in our brain. Usually that, that those things are still pretty much, um, you know, still, um, still there, but new information that, that they have to learn when the disease already affected, you know, can be harder uh, for them to recall. Because again, the way the brain store information is not organized anymore once you have all these cognitive change. But things that happened in the past could be easier for them to, to remember because it's been in there for so long time. It is easier for them to, to, to talk about it. They have talked about it for so many times in the past, you know, and that is something that happened in um, um, other conditions also like Alzheimer, things that happened in the past, they tend to remember more than things that is recent. Now, is, is cognition also affected early on? Like, I, I do recall trying to teach both my kids different things throughout the years and it, it just kind of didn't stick. It didn't, maybe that was my fault for not, you know, following through and, you know, I don't know. But I, I just felt like there was something not quite normal in their developmental years. Yeah, correct. You know, um, the change in terms of cognitive function actually was found to, to happen quite earlier than we thought. A lot of time we recognize Huntington disease when you develop the uh, physical symptoms, when you have career, when you have balance problem. But the actual change in terms of your thinking, you know, it can happen up to even 15 years before you develop all other physical symptoms. So that's this subtle change that happened for years, you know, that maybe not recognized because it was so mild at the beginning and you think maybe you just not pay attention or you're not focusing or you're not interested in things that I want to talk to you or, or teach you. Um, so all these chain can actually start, you know, 10, 15 years before you have the physical change. When you want to teach Huntington person something, I think repeat, you know, the, you know, the repeat teaching them the same thing again and again, usually help like practice still make, you know, still help with this. And again, break thing into small, simple tasks, you know, have them learn one at a time, you know, it can be helpful. Now I have um, another uh, symptom that I want to discuss is actually very interesting when, when I you know, learn about this. So, you know, they, the scientists found that Huntington person actually have problem with the perception. And as you know, two interesting things that I found. So they found that Huntington person can have problem with emotion recognition you know, from, from looking at the facial expression and from just hearing the tone of your voice. So there were a group of scientists that did the experiment where they show Huntington person photo of a person with different facial expression, like, you know, one per picture, maybe they're sad, another one they're depressed, another one they're happy. And then they have Huntington person try to identify all the facial expression on these pictures and they found that the patient has difficulty identifying all these emotion um, 
change by looking at the, the person face or you know actually by just listen to the tone of the voice you know the person may not be able to recognize that and this actually can 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 happen you know years before the onset of the physical change also you know and i mean it seems to be like a subtle thing but think about it this can actually easily lead into a relationship problem or you may feel like you know you know i'm so upset i'm angry right right now why why you don't seem to care or don't seem to aware that i am sad or i am upset you know you know but it could easily be because they cannot recognize all these uh, non-verbal cue that they, you try to express to them do they feel the emotion and just can't express it or so they actually cannot understand the emotion that you try to express to them let's say you know like let's say uh, maybe your you you maybe your children has huntington right and let's say you are upset because they don't you know keep all the toys in place and you're so upset like you know you raise your voice you show your face that you are unhappy that they don't keep all the stuff in place you know but but you know then they just doesn't seem to care they don't seem to aware that you're upset about this you know this actually could be because of the disease but not because they're not caring about you they just cannot recognize all the emotional expression and the tone of your voice and to help cope with that you know so when you talk to the person with huntington you may want to actually say your emotion to them clearly just say that I am unhappy, I am sad, I am depressed, instead of just kind of saying and, you know, use nonverbal cue because they cannot detect these, you know, expression or emotion you want to show to them. That's a really interesting point that I don't know very many people are uh, recognizing so much. So I appreciate you bringing that up tremendously yeah i think it's kind of very interesting because you know if if you don't aware about this you can easily thought that a person is not caring or doesn't you know feel bothered that you are unhappy you're upset even though you kind of try to show them because they don't realize unless you have to you know you state it clearly to them yeah so um you know this can uh, if you understand about this change it can prevent you from you know problem in relationship you know knowing that your loved one doesn't look like they react to your feeling because they do not aware about it unless you clearly state the words to them that you're unhappy or sad okay so communication is is quite a lot more complicated with huntingtons um and expressing your feelings in verbal form as opposed to uh showing you know your, your facial or tone of your expressions they is may not best be able to detect that oh good i good to know yep yep now another interesting part of the perception problem in huntington person is they have problem uh, with um perception of time like how long time has passed you know so again there's an, a group of scientists who did an experiment so they have huntington patient tap the finger to follow a speed a rhythm of a metronome and then after a while they stop the metronome and have the patient keep tapping at the same pace that they tap early on with a metronome and they found a patient cannot figure out like how fast or how slow they should tap to keep the same pace you know so they have this problem with you know estimating how long time has passed so maybe you will tell your 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 kids that or your loved one like okay let's get ready get dressed in 15 minutes so that we can go out for dinner but then 30 minutes later, you see they are still, you know, you figure out what to wear. I mean, I mean, it's, you know, I think, I mean, this example is not just because of only one problem with the perception of time, but there are other things that happen in the brain that, that make them take longer times to do things. So, um, you know, when you um, have spatial um, things to do, spatial event to attend, to go outside house, you definitely want to, you know, get extra time, plenty of time for a person. And then you may have to remind them like, okay, it's 10 minutes past, you know, okay, we have five minutes left. But again, try not to like pressure them also because they can get very anxious with that and make things even slower. I, I think the big one for a lot of us uh, who are caregivers of HD, individuals is 
getting ready for doctor appointments, clinical trial appointments. It's almost like you have to start at least two or three hours before just to give enough time and you have to just go slow and be patient because otherwise it can be so frustrating for everybody. Yeah, I see. Yeah, that's, I think that's very common and that's very good part that you want to really, um, you know, make sure you have extra time for any, any uh, situation, any task that is out of your, your normal routine. Yeah. And um, now um, I'm going to uh, move on and talk more about the executive function, you know, which is a um, pretty important um, function of the brain that is affected by the disease. So executive function is something that you require for your day to day activities and also a lot of things, you know, if you are working also, um, you know, it's things such as organization skills, planning skill, prioritization skill, making decision, you know, attention, concentration and solving problem. So all these, you know, skills that you actually need for day-to-day -day activities and for your work is actually affected by the disease also. Um, and again, these symptoms can start even before the onset of the uh, physical change. So, you know, I have seen many patients who doesn't have much, you know, career movement, but they were not able to maintain jobs because of all these changes that happen to the brain. You know, if that's a project that is, you know, in a rush that have to be finished in a limited time, you know, it can be very difficult for a person to prioritize things, to plan for things and organize, you know, how can they finish those those projects on time you know and and even simple day-to-day uh, -day activities such as again you know good example you know can you get dressed uh, in 15 minutes to go out for a doctor appointment just to get dressed you know um, you know it's actually can be very difficult things for a Huntington patient to do because you know, to figure out, you know, what you, you have to dress, you have to think what kind of occasion is this, what kind of clothes would be appropriate to wear, um, you know, is this shirt match with this, you know, pants or not, you know, is it a good thing to, uh, that go together or um, which part should I put on, first should I put the shoes on first or shirt on first, you know, prioritizing, you know, all these tasks, actually the simple things can be hard for a person um, to do also. Um, and um, I don't know if any of you experience, you know, these, you know, change. But but it is actually very important um, skills that we need, and and it can be affected by the disease. Or um, even thinking about, let's say, um, maybe your wife used used to uh, plan for a big party for, let's say, holidays. You know, invited all the friends and family. You know, but now you know it's going to be harder for for person to do that because. You know, to plan for a party, you have to uh, figure out like who would be an appropriate person to invite, what kind of menu or dishes will be good to be enough for a person, what ingredients are include, you know, um, buying all the ingredients, which one to cook first, you know, all these little small steps that, that we take for granted, we do it without thinking, you know, it can be very hard for a person. So, you know, to help cope with this, you know, again, um, you know, you... You know, if if you want to have all these, you know, tasks done, you actually may have to help a person break all these things into small, simple steps, you know, kind of tell them, okay, let's think about who should we invite for the party first, list them down, help them, you know, okay, next, let's try to plan for what dish, you know, we should cook, you know, and what ingredients we should um, buy, kind of help break things down into small, simple steps for them, have them do one at a time, you know, usually helpful, help them prioritize which tasks should be done first you know so these can be helpful things and even in day-to-day -day activities like you know getting dressed in the morning shower eating you know it is usually very helpful to keep your day very structured very routine you know keep the patient structure very uh, the patient uh, day very structured have them do the same thing at the same time every day. Maybe it's like automatic, you know, you go get up in the morning, brush your teeth first, then change your clothes and have breakfast, you know, keep it, you know, very, very routine. You know, it usually help them, you know, uh, dealing with this problem with, you know, executive dysfunction in the brain. Is this also including um, hygiene and personal, um, you know, taking care of your personal needs. Correct. As well. 
Yes, correct. You know, these day-to-day -day activities, I mean, we do it without even thinking, but, you know, truly, you know, think about it. It actually requires a lot of um, planning, prioritization, you know, organizing skill. You have to figure out, okay, to brush my teeth, you know, I have to get the toothbrush, put, uh, put the toothpaste on. I have to brush my teeth after I finish. Then I'm going to decide what clothes I'm going to wear for today. You know, which, you know, part I should put on first, my shirt or my pants, you know, all these small little things actually can be affected by the disease um, you know and it's continued to progress over time so even you know day-to-day -day activities like this could be hard for them and um, and I mean um, another problem with the self-care is also um, problem with apathy or lack of motivation that happened um, from the change in the brain so, um, you know, it's, it's very common also for, for the patient and the family to tell me, no, you know, the patient doesn't want to, to shower anymore. They doesn't want to do anything. They just want to sit and watch TV and they fall asleep so easy when they have this downtime. Like they look so, like so lazy. They kind of think kind of like that to me. But it's actually not because they are really lazy, you know, but it is because of the brain make them just kind of, you know, in this mode where they don't have motivation or interest to go out to have dinner with friends anymore, even though they used to be like very outgoing person. So it's all this change in the brain that is affected. So to help cope with this apathy or lack of interest, also you have to create a very structured day for them. You have to set routine for them, make them practice that, that again and again until it become like a habit for them. And also when the disease progress more, even though they, they have these set time, it is still harder for them to initiate the task by themselves. So you may end up have to help, you know, initiate the task for them. Let's say it's dinner time. Even though you say, oh honey, it's dinner time. They may not get up from the couch and still sit there. So you actually may have to kind of, you know, gently uh, encourage them, you know, help them get up from the chair, put them into the dining table, you know, put a food in front of them, even put a spoon in their hand to help, you know, initiate the actual task and they may be able to continue it by themselves, you know, with your help. So, um, you know, it could be very challenging, you know, when the disease progress more. What about sleep patterns? Why is it so hard for them to sleep at night and stay awake during the day? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it is actually for multiple reasons, you know, partly, you know, the disease actually kind of affect your sleep on its own also, you know, I have heard patients who either sleep too much or cannot fall asleep at all and their cycle is, you know, all over the place, they sleep at daytime and go to, you know, and they watch TV whole night, you know, it's because of the disease that actually, you know, kind of affect your sleep pattern also. But again, to help cope with this, you know, with any patient with cognitive problem, actually, you just have to try to keep the day very structured, very routine for them. If they have sleep problem, you know, at night, you want to make sure you try to shift that bedtime set at a specific time each day. Okay, this is a bedtime. We're going to turn off the light. We will set a tone, a relaxing tone in the bedroom, turn on soothing music put them into bed, keep everything quiet and down and try to get them uh, to sleep. If it is very hard for them to sleep, you can ask the doctor to see if there's any medication that can help if you really need to. Um, and then the daytime, you want to keep them awake, not let them fall asleep during the day randomly. Some patients will feel very tired and they need some naps during the day. You can do that, but you have to keep it structured and you, you don't want to do it too late in the day like let's say you can do it late morning or early afternoon but don't do it at 6 p.m because then at night you cannot fall asleep so you want to keep them busy and active so that at night time then they can fall asleep and if they have to take naps then schedule a certain time of the day not too late so they can kind of get some refreshment you know get some more energy um, uh, to do things during the day mm -hmm. Easy to talk about, hard to do. <laughs> I know, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite hard, but it, it, can, it can be done. You know, I have seen patients who, you know, have this problem and the family, they try so hard, they try to shift the cycle, you know, get them tired and do things during the day. So at night time, they like fall asleep and then don't let them like doze off too often during the day, keep them awake. 
Okay, so next one, I'm going to talk about um, problem with um, impulsivity, disinhibition, which sometimes can easily lead to irritability and anger. So this is again um, because of the Huntington disease that is actually affected part of the brain. You know, we have this part of the brain called frontal lobe, which is the area that is, you know, you know, the area that will kind of stop us from doing things that is, you know, not, in, not appropriate or things that can be hurtful to other people like you know, I don't like this person. I want to say this to them, but I still can stop myself because, you know, my frontal lobe stopped me from doing that. You know, or I want to do this, you know, things in public, but I know it's not appropriate because my frontal lobe stopped me. But with Huntington person, you know, all these, you know, part of the brain you know, is affected. So the person sometimes may, you know, say things that could be hurtful to you even though you try to help them but they may say things that is not nice to you or may do inappropriate things you know um, or sometimes it could be um, um, more like a physical thing for example sometimes the patient will actually very common they may try to put too much food in the mouth you know and then they choke because of that you know because the brain doesn't stop you know you from you know doing that or you know a patient who may have a lot of gait and balance problem they try to get up so fast and try to walk so fast you know even though they have balance problem and they're very impulsive you know in doing things or you know sometimes it can leads to problem like you know when let's say you know bad things happen in life you know things doesn't go well you know you can easily get you know into you know using alcohol or losing drugs to 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 uh, solve the problem because that part of the brain to stop these things is not functioning well anymore so it's not uncommon to to uh, uh, to see a patient who will say oh yeah i have each history with this abuse uh, alcohol abuse in the past or drug abuse in the past because the brain cannot um, stop you know from you know all these things that you know is not good for you um i don't know anybody has um you know, uh, same problem or, or even like sometime, like let's say something doesn't go along as expected and let's say you're in a little bit argument, that sometimes can easily escalate it and into like an outburst or an anger that, you know, normally the person used to be very nice and, you know, now with the Huntington, you know, they change, they become very easily irritable, they get, you know, upset so easily. Sometimes they can be like, you know, somewhat abusive or some, you know, also, you know, verbally or physically because the part of the brain that's supposed to stop this behavior is not functioning well anymore. Dr. Oh, is that also something that happens early on? Uh, good question. Any symptoms? It's actually kind of varies, you know, I mean, your cognition tie very closely to your mood and your behavior, you know, and each person is a little bit different in terms of the symptoms that manifest, you know, I would say some patient, especially the one that has earlier onset of the symptom, let's say in a teenage year, in a 20, the 30s, they tend to have more psychiatric problem. Um, but it can happen in any part, any course, uh, you know, of the, in any timeline of the, the illness. Some patients, you know, fine for a long time and all of a sudden they have this mood change, behavior change, and then it lasts for a while and then it goes away. So, so it could be varies, but uh, I would say a relatively younger person, sometimes they have more of a psychiatric problem. It seems like some of the... Um some of the impulsivity or, or, or outbursts can be very similar to Tourette's. Um, I would say uh, to the, the outlook, you could be, the, you know, the resolve, it could be, could be the same thing. I would say to that patient, it's different in the way that, yeah, they, uh, a lot of time it's a tics that they have twitching of different parts of the body, but some Tourette's patient will have time that they say like the curse or they say inappropriate words or they have like inappropriate gesture. So, so, you know, I mean, on the outside, it actually can look kind of, kind of similar. Um, but for the two that patient is tend to be like a burst out, like, you know, it's like a sudden movement or a sudden, you know, 
like um, verbal output that they do and they, they feel relief when doing it. Actually, they have an urge to do it and they feel relief when, do, when they do it and they can suppress it to some degree when it's not too severe. But this is actually somewhat different than, than Huntington patient that they actually have this problem because, you know, the filter of the brain actually not functioning well. So, so they actually say this thing and they actually a lot of time feel sad afterwards that they, they, they hurt your feeling or they do this to you. It's just like they cannot stop it. They don't actually, I don't think they have an urge or feel really relief to do it, but they just cannot stop themselves from doing it. It just happened. So, um, you know, to help, you know, uh, coping with this situation. So first, you know, if you end up in, in you know, a situation when they, the person become very upset, you know, first you want to stay very calm and stay in control. You don't want to become emotional together with them and try to rest your voice because it's going to escalate the problem. And um, try to assess the situation, see if you can find trigger. A lot of time, you know, you may be able to identify trigger and, and the trigger sometimes can be very simple. Let's say sometimes because they are, you know, outside a comfort zone, it's a different environment. There's a lot of stimulation, you know, to them, um, too much to handle for them, or they just feel like they're hungry or thirsty. Uh, could be because of, you know, they are in pain, you know. So, you know, if by any chance, if you can identify this trigger and try to, um, solve it for them or try to avoid for them it can prevent the situation from happening again or or getting escalate and it's also nice to to remind yourself that you know even though they may say hurtful things to you or do like you know uh, you know these inappropriate things to you it is not because they intentionally doing it they don't intention to to make you you know, feel bad or hurt you, but it's just because of the disease that, you know, cause this change in the brain so that, you know, and they cannot stop all these behavior, all these, you know, uh, things from happening. And, um, you know, if the situation is escalated to the point that you feel unsafe, do not hesitate to call police too, okay? So, so you, you want to make sure you, um, you know, remove all uh, weapons or things that could be dangerous, you know, from, from your house and make sure you have emergency number um, next to you, you know, on a, you know, easy area that you can find. So in case things all of a sudden just getting worse, you want to make sure you, you can, you know, find help. And also, again, I think we talk about this many times, keeping the person with Huntington Day very structured, very routine is going to be helpful because, you know, if there's something changed, all of a sudden they get confused, they're going to feel anxious and irritable and frustrated. And that can also easily lead, lead to these um, behavioral problem or this change. So keep, you know, a person, they're very structured, very routine. It's helpful. And, and if the things, you know, getting worse with the part of it, you know, it's too much for me to handle, talk to your doctor because there are medication that they can use to help suppress all these impulsivity, all these, you know, outbursts, all these issues. So, I mean, I think uh, the next, the last one actually I will talk uh, is actually about perseveration. <laughs> so, um, again, you know, that part of the brain to inhibiting things is not functioning well anymore. So, you, you may have seen like your, your uh, loved one with Huntington, you know, three, keep repeating things again and again to you. Let's say maybe they got a new, like maybe your kids got a new toy, or so they may keep, you know, talking about that again, 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 or they may talk about, you know, a, uh, achievement that they have let's say oh like you know i i got this um items from um the store and they may keep talking about that for a whole week or they may upset at something let's say they cannot go out with uh, friends last weekend because of the rain or something like that and they just you know kind of keep talking about same thing again and again you know for a long time so again you know this is because of the brain um you know that's supposed to st stop all this perseveration it's not functioning properly so you, you end up repeat all the things again and again. So if this is the case, you know, try your best to, you know, if you empathize with them, they probably not feel comfortable sometimes to keep repeating things again, you know, either and see if you can try to distract them um, from, from this topic, you know, by, you know, you can 
try to use sense of humor, you know, try to see if you can shift that forecast the idea. If it is very hard for you to shift the, the forecast the idea, you know, sometimes you may have, just have to get along with them, kind of confirm that, that you hear what they want you to tell you, you know, so that they feel settled, they feel relieved that, okay, someone already know what I want to, to tell, to, to express. Um, or you can remind them, oh yeah, we already, um, you know, heard about that. You already tell us so that, that they know that we already uh, discussed about a topic. And again, if it is too much to the point that you cannot handle anymore, discuss with your doctor because there are medication that can help, you know, calms down this um, situation. Okay. Is that part of the obsessive compulsive behaviors, that perseveration? Yes, yeah, it's kind of same thing. Things over and over. Again, again. Or, you know, I have some patients who may, you know, want to go to the workplace every day still. You know, even though they haven't been working for years, they still want to do the same task. They want to go to do the same thing, you know. they Or they may want to eat same food every day. I want the same sandwich every day, you know, something like that. So, perseveration kind of obsession, you know, can also be part of this um, change from Huntington disease. Oh so, boy, that's very familiar. <laughs> yeah, so so I mean, in summary, like you 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 can see that you know there's many changes that can happen as part of the disease, and all these changes going to progress over the time, over the years. You know, one important thing is you know you you know if you are a caregiver for a person, you want to kind of you know periodically reassess all these change that happen because there may be um, you know some intervention that you have to do for example at some point a person may not be able to take their own pills because they they are disorganized they cannot remember it's time to take medication so you may actually have to kind of take over the medication management for them this is actually a very common problem or driving also driving ability is also another concerning task like you know, as the disease progress, the, the, the thought process, the reaction time is going to be slower, the judgment may not be right, so it may not be safe for a person to drive, you know, and it is going to be hard to tell a person you should not drive anymore when they, they drive for 40 years. So one good way is actually to have them get driving evaluation. So there are uh, something called driving to independence that you can get like a medical evaluation for driving. Or, you know, you can just go to the DMV and tell them you want roadside tests, you know, so they can sit with a person when they drive and see if they're still um, safe on the road or not. And, you know, as things progress, you know, it is very common for Huntington person to need 24-7 care. So it's good to kind of reassess these change over the time so we can prevent, you know, things from happening, like taking wrong pill, driving out, you know, and has, you know, a problem on the street, you know, and, and then you can plan for, let's say, long-term care for the person when the time comes. And you can discuss with them ahead of time so they can participate in decision making. They may even go, can go out to look at the place with you and see where they would like you know when it's time you know for them to, to move to facility or to get more help hello uh, I don't think I can hear your voice Melissa I'm so sorry <laughs> okay <laughs> very good information uh, have you had any experience with juvenile Huntington's um, I, I would say, you know, we, I seen a few younger onset patients, but mostly we only see adult. Um, in Arizona, mm -hmm. um, Phoenix Children Hospital has a, a pediatrician who specializes in movement disorder and Huntington disease. So I think usually younger patients will go to them. So we see more older patients. I would say I have some in that twenties, but if they are like, you know, young, like, you know, in, you know, uh, you know, like five, six year old or like 10, 11 year old, I don't have uh, that young patient. They're referred to children's. Yes. Good. Yeah. I know there aren't that many, but um, it's always good to find out where to go. Yeah, so Phoenix Student Hospital, um, I, I hope I can say his name, Dr. Kruwer, he's very nice and he's actually very familiar with Huntington patients. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Dr. O for spending so much time with us. This has been a very enlightening presentation. And um, it's my pleasure to talk to everyone today. I hope there's some useful tips that you can use, um, you know, for yourself or for your family. And um, 
Have a great day.